You all ate your cookies. You can do better than that. Come on. Hey, hey, hey. hey. You know, I'm from Jersey, and I got friends, so. <laughs> what a wonderful opportunity to get to tell this story here in Providence. I'm a RISD guy. I, I went to uh, the Rhode Island School of Design for graduate school in industrial design. And, and who knows who this guy is? Mark Harrison. So Mark Harrison was chair of the uh, industrial design program at RISD for a million years. Um, probably outside of my family, had the most profound influence on my life than any human being I've ever known. And I carry it with me to this day. It will carry it to my grave, and I hope I pass some of it along to my kids. Um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, until he developed Lou Gehrig's disease and died tragically from that in the late 90s, um, Mark was doing things that didn't have names. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, he was doing contextual and ethnographic research. Nobody knew what that was, really. He was doing sustainable design. Nobody had that word. He was doing universal design and a litany of projects that were funded uh, at RISD. And he talked companies out of lots and lots of money. Um, one of the <laughs> he, companies like mine. Uh, but you know, one of the things that, that Mark did for me is um, he told me, Schwartz, if you want to uh, have your teaching fellowship, you're going to work on this project I'm about to start with the American Red Cross. And what we're going to do is nothing short of reinvent the way blood is collected in this country. Uh, and so we did that. And I'm going to talk to you about that uh, a little bit. But what I learned from this guy um, led me on this path in my career where I always looked for things to do that had a strong social context. And so began my Mother Teresa period. Um, I, I went to the American Red Cross after uh, two years of graduate school and then actually a year uh, nearly working at RISD on this program. Um, and I spent 12 years at the Red Cross. I was the only designer who arrived there. I was a punk kid. Um, I was 26 years old. Uh, they had no idea, uh, essentially, what to do with me. They had to create a, uh, a job for me. But my, my role was to bring to life this uh, mobile blood collection system. And then I did a bunch of other things. But what I found out along the way, as I wound up out here, is that the stuff in the Mother Teresa period it ain't that different than the mother bottom line period, uh, ultimately. You know, in the middle, I had my political period. I got over it. Uh, I lobbied for the medical device industry for a while at AdvaMed. As Saul mentioned, I, I uh, ran IDSA for 10 years. Uh, it was a diplomat's job. Um, and then I sort of jumped off the edge of the earth, and I, and I went into the corporate world. And I always looked for ways, keeping in mind what Mark had taught me, how do I do things that mean something? Yeah, I got to check the box. I got to get... Uh, products out the door. I got to run my team responsibly. But the fundamental was that there's a lot of things I could do under the radar that no business would pay for that ultimately did, did some real good. Uh, or I could hang on to things that had that potential. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about coyotes. Um, and now, I live way up north in Wisconsin. And for those of my friends from north of the border, I can see Canada from my house. <laughs> So where I live in Wisconsin, I live in the woods. And every so often, a coyote, much like this one, comes into my yard. And when he sees me, or he sees one of us, fortunately, we're usually in the house, because he won't come in the yard otherwise, he stares at us vacantly. No emotion at all. He doesn't care that we exist. All he thinks about is, can I eat this person? Can I eat this thing? He wants my dog and my cat, but he's not going to get them. So what, the, the reason I'm showing you this coyote is a lot of the things that we encounter in the world in critical situations like in healthcare, in, uh, in, in you know, cops and firefighters, we heard a little bit about this morning. The, the, the products have no emotion. They just kind of stare at you like a coyote. What is up with that? You know, they're devoid of any emotion. So um, I worked for the Red Cross for 12 years. I answered the call. It's not a way to get rich, but you'll never feel better in your life by doing this kind of work. Um, and where we began was with this mobile blood collection system. And this basically is a circus that moves every day without a plan. Half the blood in the country is collected by the Red Cross, and they have these blood mobiles who's given blood here. I can't see a thing. All right, that's, that's good. That's better than me. Uh, and this poor guy has to unload all this stuff one at a time. It's completely ridiculous. So they finally get all this set up in a gymnasium or in a shopping mall, and they, they lay a bunch of, of uh, people out on it, and the nurses are scurrying around, and they're sticking needles into you, 
Uh, and it's not a very pleasant situation. And in fact, the interpretation which grew out of World War II is this is a clinical experience. It isn't. Um, this poor guy, isn't he the dude? Look at that hair. Um, this poor guy, he's trying to see what's going on. Otherwise, he's staring at the ceiling. He's being treated like he just was in a car accident. This poor nurse actually has to bend over about 250 times in an average day just to agitate the coagulant in these blood bags. That is not a rich experience. That is a coyote experience. So what we did with some help from friends at Herman Miller, who we worked with at the time, and also the Tropitone Lawn Furniture Company, is we put it in a different context. We created a, a materials handling system. No big deal to do that. Um, and we also uh, took lawn furniture and purpose-built a design that could act as a blood donor lounge, giving it an ordinary and normal uh, context. And so this was the experience then. So, uh, so instead of lying staring at the ceiling, uh, you were set up in threes. You could talk to your neighbor. It became socially interactive. The nurse was seated. She was looking at you eye to eye. She didn't have to bend over. All of her supplies were there in those little pods. And the drawers that Herman Miller so kindly provided us to had a duplicate set back at the blood center, which they swapped out every night, making this very easy. And so rather than having that sort of very arcane, coyote-like experience, we, we made it a social networking experience uh, before anybody knew what that word was. So um, moving right along, there was other things to be done in the Red Cross. In particular, we also had self-contained blood mobiles. You've probably all seen these in parking lots. Uh, they have bookmobiles and mammogram mobiles. This is a blood mobile. And as you can see from the joyful look on the people who are working in here, uh, and from this guy who literally, he cracked his head on the light and knocked it out. I snapped this picture just as he cracked it, was like recoiling from cracking his head on the wall and the light went out briefly. Um, there's a guy, I mean, she's got her back to this guy. He's got his arm up in the air. He could be bleeding to death for all she knows. And, and, and his feet are in the head of the guy in front of him. That is a coyote experience. Uh, here is a workstation. Do I need to say anything here? No, I'll move on. So what we did is we, um, and, and by the way, along this path, we, look, we watched at least 10,000 blood donations uh, along this journey. We calculated the number of field trips we took one time. So we borrowed a little something from the television industry. We found the company that makes these broadcast vans where the sides pop out. This was before all the RVs that did that. And so we had them build one of these. And we moved it to where I worked at the Red Cross near Washington. And, uh, and that's kind of what it looked like. Uh, and they delivered it empty. And over one summer, a colleague of, of mine at the Red Cross and I, we put in the interior. And again, leveraging some help from our friends at the Red Cross, or excuse me, at uh, Herman Miller, we created this. We created an architecturally normal space that had long, tall windows that gave you a view of the ground, the horizon, and the sky. You again could you know, take all the best principles for what we've done on the external blood mobiles and bring them inside. And so you walked into somebody's living room, or at least their office. You had a place over here where you could socialize after you gave blood, and, and it felt a little more humane. Hopefully not a coyote experience. And when you populate it with people, it just felt like you were looking inside uh, a normal room, and you could drive this from place to place. Um, probably the, the biggest prize, though, in the work in that 12 years was when I um, worked on, on disaster services delivery. Every mom and pop shop in America has made one of these for a local Red Cross chapter. None of them match. Uh, they slop chili out of these things 24 hours a day. If you've just lost everything, one of these trucks rolls up in your neighborhood and you've got to stand out on the street. It's just not a very uh, social uh, experience. These people do an amazing job, uh, but they're not given very much, not very many uniform tools to work with. So what we created was this. A, a purpose-built disaster vehicle that no matter where it went in the country, like a telephone truck, it's always the same inside. Uh, it has, instead of not having a place like, you know, an ice cream truck for you to walk up to, now there's a way to kind of, you know, ha be greeted, have sort of emotional connection, and if you need to get out of the weather, you can go inside, you can be interviewed, uh, et cetera. We created with uh, Cambro, the restaurant supply company, uh, a system for again, moving food around, moving materials around, and to this day, actually, they're using some of these purpose-built designs, uh, not only for the Red Cross, but also uh, for their own purposes. This picture was taken last summer at a, a hurricane that occurred somewhere. I actually uh, got it off the web, and I thought, this was, we did this work initially in 1985, and they're still doing it. So, uh, moving on, I worked in, uh, in Motorola, 
Uh, and I worked in the part of Motorola that makes all the communications equipment for the cops and the firefighters and the security and safety people. One of the things we learned in the field through observation is that these guys suffer from situational disability. They would qualify under the Americans with Disabilities Act. They could park in a handicapped space. Well, they can park wherever they want. Um, but what we found out is if he's trying to use a radio, he's got these big heavy gloves on. How is he going to feel the, the buttons? If this guy's in this situation, he can't see, he can't hear, and in fact, he's under such incredible stress like these guys are, his cognitive function goes down. So what does that tell you about how to design a small $6,000 handheld radio? Well, it tells you that when they're blind and maybe their cogitation isn't so good, you better put the emergency button at the bottom of the antenna so all they have to do is follow their hand down. You better differentiate the two knobs on the top so they know the difference between volume and channel changing, and it better be really robust. Uh, when the World Trade Center went down, uh, unfortunately, for about a week afterwards, we heard the emergency pings off of a lot of our Motorola police radios. It was just uh, it was terrible for us working there at the time. Uh, firefighters had their own unique needs. Uh, they needed colors that were more vivid. They needed a really, really big thumbprint because of the, uh, the gloves they wore. Uh, etc. And this led us into a whole uh, set of conceptual design languages that made these products easier to use, as you can see. So then, now I either had a lot of great experiences in my career or I can't hold a damn job. Uh, because then I went to Procter & Gamble and this was quite a shape shift for me. Obviously I went from, we did do a lot of consumer stuff at Motorola in the group I ran, but uh, I really struggled with what was I going to do at P&G and still hold to my dear principles. Um, we had uh, these kinds of products. How do you find meaning there? How do you give people a rich experience? Um, the business in P&G sees, and Roger Martin, if he, I don't think he's still here, but he, he, would, he would say, yeah, I get that. It's a very data-driven company. Uh, but in design, we, we saw the consumer this way. Uh, and what we had to do, the challenge we had, was to kind of marry those two things uh, together. So I'm going to show you a little video clip about a young woman in Morocco who wants to do her laundry. And unless your Moroccan is fluent, I will read the subtitles for you. Uh, just watch the story. I never went to high school and therefore never had a stable job. I got married when I was 25 and now have two kids, Majaline and Adam. My life is dedicated to them and my husband. But life is hard and goes by fast. My husband works as a waiter. So my wish is to have a job of my own and help them out with the expenses. After I send Magdalene to school, Adam stays with me at home. I demand a lot of my life and I hand wash all the clothes as I don't have a washing machine like most of the women in the world. So between the soaking and the rubbing, half a day is already gone and only a little left for other activities. I feel like I don't have control over my time. My husband's work demands that his clothes are perfectly clean. And my children's clothes are always stained. I am now only satisfied with Ariel. It has really given me time to do what I love. With more free time now, I've been doing tattoos for my friends and relatives. My clients love my henna. And sometimes I would teach them a little about how it's done, but not how I mix the paste. It's a business secret. Now I make decent money, which is helpful to my husband. I feel like I have a status in the family and society. And I feel more confident. My dream is for my children to get a higher education. God willing, Magdalene will go to college someday and I would like to support her financially. Adam, come here. I get always verklempt here. Hold on to my hand, let's go home. Gotta give P&G the plug. So for her, it wasn't about brighter whites and more brilliant colors, it was about getting time back. And if you moved into that market, and you tried to sell these products in the same business proposition to these consumers, you would fail. Uh, but by studying them and really listening and looking at what they're doing, what you realize is she wants to recapture time back because she doesn't have a washing machine. And this product, it washes her clothes fast. A few rubs and she's done. So th that was, for me, I didn't work in this category. I worked in a number of others. There was always that thing to find. And it was just incredibly compelling 
that in this big consumer packaged goods company, uh, you could find such deep meaning in people's lives and touch them in, in little ways. It was wonderful. Okay, so now on to the present. I'm holding on to this job, at least for the moment. Um, I work in GE Healthcare, as Saul mentioned, I lead global design there. Um, we uh, develop products I hope none of you in this room ever have to come in contact with. I know some of you have from the very compelling stories we've, uh, we've heard in the last couple of days. You know, we make all the heavy stuff from, from uh, CAT scanners and MRs and ultrasound to interventional cardiology to lots of little delicate things as well, and we do a lot of healthcare related services. Please go to healthimagination.com when you get home. Um, so I'm going to talk about a subject which I've heard several times in the last couple of days, and this has to do with mammography. Uh, these women obviously look very anxious because what's about to happen to them? They're going to have a coyote experience. They're going to have an experience with one of these. Is it a drill press? Is it a bandsaw? No, it's a mammography machine. <laughs> and it's a tit crusher and it hurts. <laughs> now the problem with this machine is it makes you adjust to it. Uh, first of all, you know about the breast compression part. It's very uncomfortable. I experienced it once as a volunteer. I wish not to repeat it. Um, uh, the other thing about it is this, this big detector head, it has to move around. You've got to kind of torque yourself and move with it. So this, pardon me for the clinical images here, but this is not your Aunt Grace. This is a breast crushing witch. <laughs> this is Nurse Ratchet. She's there to hurt you. And, and look at how kindly she looks and how happy this woman looks. That's bullshit. <laughs> so, you know, th this is more like it uh, for any of you ladies and gentlemen who've, ha who've experienced this. And so we set out to see how could we make this more humane. What if this machine embraced you? What if, what if, it, if you decided how you wanted it to greet you when you arrived? Uh, so what we've done is created a concept where um, this machine uh, doesn't make you move to adjust to it. It adjusts to you. Uh, this floor, as you'll see in a little clip I'm going to show, uh, you can decide, do you want to be on the beach? Do you want to be in a field of leaves? Do you want to be swimming? When you walk into it, it's there greeting you and something is going on. This entire bit of technology moves out of the way and only at the last minute does it come uh, to embrace you. And also the uh, the part where your breast is compressed, there's a study that's been done that says if you're allowed to compress your breast yourself, like giving yourself narcotics in the hospital, you'll compress it more because you have some control. So, have a watch. is that the technologist can stay in your eyes all the time. This OLED screen, which is on the back of the rad shield, gives her everything she needs to know, and it's a touch screen. All technology that's available. And the floor, when you walk into the room, you could even decide how you want it to greet you. In this case, we're just kind of using this flowing leaves theme. And the entire detector head uh, is separated um, from, from the breast support, and it moves in slowly as you need it to. So uh, I also would like to talk to you briefly about work we're doing in emerging markets. In India, lots of babies die, and they die because of a simple thing, they don't have access to an infant warmer. If, if this poor mom's baby is having a problem and needs to be in a warmer, in an incubator, they just don't exist. So what we did was we created one that uh, is three times less costly. It's not going to go in Pala's co collection right away, but it was made out of indigenous manufacturing processes, and it's the kind of thing that could be put to other emerging markets. And by the way, central Los Angeles is also an emerging market. So is rural Minnesota. Um, and finally, I want to end up with um, work we're doing right now in pediatric experiences. Um, 70 to 80 percent of kids three to eight years old and even older have to be sedated when they have an MR or CT. Often they have a needle uh, stuck somewhere in them. They're getting contrast media. They may have cancer. What their parents are concerned about is not what might be wrong, but how am I going to get my kid through this? There's an anxiety journey. Many of you have been through this yourselves or with your own kids. So what we set about to figure out is what if we could create something called medical play? 
What if we could change the subject and create illusions and reduce sedation significantly because the kids were in the middle of a story uh, and they had some context around what was happening to them? So, okay, here we are. This is, this is the modern era. Like, what the hell is this? What's that going to do to me? What are they going to plug this into? Is this going to crush my head? Just imagine the trauma when you go through the door, you know, where the monster is. I mean, this is a room full of coyotes. So um, a five-year-old, when they encounter a CAT scanner, if you've ever seen one, that's what it looks like. And we thought, well, why does it have to be that way? What if it couldn't be part of some sort of an adventure that you're on, that you know about before you go? What if you were dressed up as a superhero? What if the entire staff in the place uh, was part of the story too? They can dress up, they can play the part. So we work with the Betty Brin Children's Museum in, um, in Milwaukee, phenomenal place, world-class place with their child development specialists. 150,000 kids come through here every year. And, uh, and, and they don't hurt themselves, and they're, in, they're part of a story. Uh, so what we did was this. So this happens to be um, uh, one of the adventures. This is uh, uh, the Yellow Submarine Adventure. And it is part of this hero's journey that you learn about before you uh, even go um, to the hospital. And you get rewards along the way, and you lay still at that moment in the story where you have to, specifically because you know you need to in the story. And they do it. And I'll show you a couple of others. This is a nautical one. Uh, this is, this is a, a jungle adventure. We actually put pina colada smell in here. Uh, the parents love it. We play with lighting, et cetera. We have characters that all have a role in the thing. And in the first three weeks that the first suite was installed at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, kids were sedated 90% less. I cried, 90% less. So. I'll leave you with this, and then I'm out of here. That's it. That's the site of the injury. The dark spot. Dr. Duval, get the laser. If I can relieve the pressure on a few key vessels, that should do it. Doctor, that's it. We've got to get back to the ship. What? GE Healthcare. Medical imaging that allows doctors to navigate the brain with a precision that until today was pure science fiction. You just said we had to get back to the ship. I did? Uh-huh. Yeah, you, you did. did. GE. Imagination at work. Anyway, folks, that's why I get out of bed in the morning. Thank you.